they say things about Islam which are alien to Islam. It does not exist in Islam. For example, many critics say that Islam is an unscientific religion. Just to give you one example, time will not permit me to give several examples. Since nowadays we are having a controversy on the famous Bangladeshi writer, Taslima Nasri, she says that the Quran mentions that the sun revolves around the earth. And if we have to believe in such an outdated book, how can the Muslims advance? And I challenge anyone to point out any verse of the Quran which says that the sun revolves around the earth. And I said this several years back when I had a debate about her in the Bombay Union of Journalists. What she is referring to is the verse of the Quran which I quoted earlier in my talk in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 33, which says, it is Allah who has created the night and the day, the sun and the moon, each one traveling in its own orbit. So here the Quran says that the sun is revolving in motion. Nowhere does the Quran say that the sun is revolving around the earth. It's her own understanding, her own interpretation. The word earth is not there in the verse of the Quran. The Quran says it revolves in a motion which I explained earlier, the Quran says besides revolving, it also rotates. When I was in school, I didn't know about that. And now science has testified that. So many a time, the critics of Islam, they say things about Islam which are alien to Islam. And very often, fourth strategy used. They mention things about Islam and after that they say that because of this, Islam is the problem for humanity. Today the problem that you have in the world is mainly because of Islam. And they say Muslims are terrorists, they are fundamentalists, they are extremists, Islam is an intolerant religion. Because of all these things, Islam is a problem for humanity. And many a time, we Muslims are apologetic, which I would rather use the strategy of turn the tables over. And today, Muslims are called as fundamentalists. What is the meaning of the word fundamentalist? Fundamentalist by definition means a person who follows the fundamentals of one particular field. For example, if a person wants to be a good mathematician, he should know, follow, and practice the fundamentals of maths. Unless he is a fundamentalist in the field of maths, he cannot be a good mathematician. For a person to be a good scientist, he should know, follow, and practice the fundamentals of science. Unless he is a fundamentalist, in the field of science, he cannot be a good scientist. You cannot paint all fundamentalists with the same brush, that all are good or all are bad. Depending in which field the person is a fundamentalist, you have to label him accordingly. For example, if we have a fundamentalist robber whose profession is to rob, he is bad for the society. He is a bane for the society. On the other hand, if we have a fundamentalist doctor, who saves hundreds of human lives, he's a boon for the society. You can't paint all fundamentalists with the same brush that all are good or all are bad. Depending in which field is the person a fundamentalist, you have to label him accordingly. As far as I'm concerned, I am a fundamentalist Muslim and I am proud to be a fundamentalist Muslim. Because I know, I strive, and I follow the principles of Islam. And I know that there is not a single fundamental of Islam, not a single teaching of Islam which is against humanity as a whole. There may be a few teachings of Islam 
which some non-Muslims may feel are against humanity. But the moment you give the logical reasoning, the statistics behind the teaching, there is not a single human being who is unbiased, who can point out a single fundamental of Islam which is against humanity as a whole. And this word fundamentalism was first coined according to the Webster Dictionary. It was used to describe the Protestant Christians in the early part of the 20th century in America. So this word first was used for the Americans, for the Protestant Christians, because they protested against the church. The church believed that the message of the Bible was from God. These Protestant Christians, they protested that not only is the message of the Bible from God, every word, every letter of the Bible is from God. If someone can prove that every letter, every word of the Bible is from God, this fundamentalism movement, it's a good movement. On the other hand, if someone can prove that every word of the Bible is not from Almighty God, then this movement is not a good movement. When we read the Oxford Dictionary, we find out, and it says that fundamentalist is a person who strictly adheres to the ancient doctrine of any religion. But when I read one of the revised edition of Oxford Dictionary, there was a slight change. It says that fundamentalist is a person who strictly adheres to the ancient doctrine of any religion, especially Islam. So especially Islam has been added in the revised edition of Oxford Dictionary. The moment you see a Muslim, your mind goes that he's a fundamentalist. And we Muslims are apologetic. I'm not a fundamentalist. I say I'm a fundamentalist. What's the problem? You cannot be a good Muslim until you are a fundamentalist Muslim. The media says, Muslim the extremist. I say, yes, I'm an extremist. I'm extremely kind, I'm extremely loving, I'm extremely merciful, I'm extremely honest, I'm extremely just. <laughs> What's wrong in being extremely kind, extremely merciful, extremely loving, extremely just, extremely honest? You can't be partly honest. When it benefits you, you're honest. When it does not benefit you, you aren't honest. According to the Quran, you have to be extremely kind, extremely merciful. If you are a Muslim, you have to be an extremist Muslim. You have to be extremely kind. You have to be extremely honest. You have to be extremely just. I want a single human being to tell me what is wrong in being extremely honest. You have to be extremist in the right direction. We Muslims should not be apologetic. No, no, no. I'm a moderate Muslim. What is a moderate Muslim? Do you follow Islam or don't follow Islam? Allah says in the Quran, Enter into Islam wholeheartedly. Surah Baqarah chapter 2, verse number 208. You can't say I want to follow part of Islam. You have to be fully just. You have to be fully honest. Extremely honest. If every human being becomes the fundamentalist Muslim, following the fundamentals of Islam, the problems of humanity will be solved. If every human being is an extremist Muslim, extremely kind, extremely loving, extremely honest, extremely just, the problems of humanity will be solved. Today, Muslims are given the label that Muslims are terrorists. Many a time, two different labels are given to the same individual for the same activity. For example, 60 years back, 70 years back. There were many Indians who were fighting for the freedom of the country when the British were ruling India. These Indians, by the British government, they were called as terrorists. But the same people, for the same activity, we common Indians, we call them as freedom fighters, as patriots. Same people, same activity, two different labels. If you agree with the view of the British government, that they had a right rule over India, then you have to call these Indians a terrorist. 
But if you agree with the view of the common Indians that the Britishers came to India to do business, they have no right to rule over us, then you will call these people as freedom fighters, as patriots. Same people, same activity, two different labels. And we find several such examples in history. Several. We know during the American Revolution in 1775, when the Britishers, when they occupied America, there were many Americans who were fighting for the freedom. And number one terrorist, according to the British government, was George Washington. George Washington, by the British government, was called as number one terrorist in 1775. Later on, he becomes the president of America, USA. Imagine, terrorist number one becomes the president of USA. And he happens to be the godfather of all the presidents to come, including George Bush. And what are my comments on George Bush? You can see my tape, Terrorism and Jihad, an Islamic perspective. And we find several such examples. Before South Africa was free, it was ruled by the white apartheid government. This white apartheid government had imprisoned Nelson Mandela for more than 25 years in Robben Islands. And they said that he was terrorist number one. Later on, after the apartheid government was removed in South Africa, when the new government came, they released Nelson Mandela and later on he got the Nobel Prize for Peace. Imagine terrorist number one getting Nobel Prize for Peace. Not that he was bad and then he became good. Not that he killed many people and then he became good. For the same activity for which he was called terrorist number one, he was given the Nobel Prize for Peace. So what we come to know today, it's in the hands of the media. Whoever is in power, whatever label they give to a person, it gets stuck. Whether it's the truth or not, that is secondary. Whoever is in power, who has control of the media, what they portray about a person, that label gets stuck to that person. Therefore, before giving a label, first you have to identify for what reason that person was striving, and then give the label. And Quran clearly mentions in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 32, that if anyone kills any other human being, unless it be for murder or for spreading corruption in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. Most of the religions say that killing innocent human being is wrong. Quran goes a step further and says that if you kill any innocent human being, it is as though you have killed the whole of humanity. And it does not stop there. It goes further and says that if you save any human life, it is as though you have saved the whole of humankind. Most of the religious scriptures do say you should not kill innocent human being. Quran goes a step further and says that if you kill any innocent human being, you have killed the whole of humanity. And if you have saved any human being, you have saved the whole of humanity. Yet, Islam is called as an intolerant religion. And I do say that Islam is an intolerant religion. Islam is intolerant towards corruption. Islam is intolerant towards injustice. Islam is intolerant towards discrimination. Islam is intolerant towards dishonesty. Islam is intolerant towards racism. Islam is intolerant towards victimization. It is an intolerant religion. See, theoretically, all the countries say that dishonesty is wrong. All the countries and all the religions, they say corruption is wrong. All of the people, they say discrimination is wrong. They say racism is wrong. They say victimization is wrong. But that is only a theory in most of the countries. Most of the countries have corruption. There's dishonesty in most of the countries. So just because Islam is intolerant towards the practices, which are prevalent in many countries, I do agree Islam is an intolerant religion. Islam is intolerant towards those things which Almighty God knows are wrong for the human being, which today many human beings feel it is a part and parcel of society. They think if you do these things, you are advanced. 
So Islam is intolerant to those things which the creator feels is wrong and many of the human beings today feel are right. Islam is intolerant towards alcoholism. Islam is intolerant towards drug addiction, towards pornography, towards prostitution, towards adultery, towards fornication. Islam is an intolerant religion. It's intolerant towards the evils of the society. Because if you're intolerant towards these things, then only will you have the solution to the problems of humanity. Many people go on the defense. Oh, Islam is not an intolerant religion. It is intolerant towards the vices. But tolerant towards the things which are good. It does not force anyone at the point of the sword. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse 256, like Rafid Deen, there is no compulsion in religion. Many people quote this and put a full stop. That's not the end of the verse. The verse continues. Like Rafid Deen, there is no compulsion in religion. Truth stands out clear from error. You have to present the truth. If you want to accept it, accept it. If you don't want to accept it, no problem. No one can force you to accept Islam at the point of the sword or the point of the gun. In this way, it is the most tolerant religion. When we analyze most of the religions, they speak good things. So what's the difference between Islam and the other religions? The difference between Islam and the other religions is that Islam, besides speaking good things, it shows you a way how to achieve that state of goodness. For example, most of the religions say that you should not rob. Hinduism says that, Christianity says that, Islam says the same. So what is the difference between Islam and the other religions? The difference is Islam, besides saying that you should not rob, it shows you a way how to achieve that state in which people will not rob. Islam has a system of zakat. One of the pillars of Islam is zakat, that every rich person who has a saving of more than the nisab level, more than 85 grams of gold, he or she should give 2.5% of that wealth every lunar year in charity to the poor people. If every rich human being gives charity, gives zakat, poverty will be eradicated from this world. There will not be a single human being who will die of hunger. Yet, even after no human being will die of hunger, yet there are people who yet want to rob to get wealth easily, to fulfill the desires which are wrong. Islam has a solution for that also. After zakat, Almighty God says in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 38, as to the thief, be it a man or a woman, chop off his or her hand as a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Non-Muslims will say chopping off the hands. In this 21st century, Islam is a barbaric religion. It's a ruthless way of life. And they think that every second person you come across in Saudi Arabia, where this law is practiced, you will find that every second person will have his hand chopped off. I have been to Saudi Arabia several times, more than 20, 30 times. Never have I come across a single human being whose hands have been chopped off. Surely there will be some people whose hands may have been chopped off, but the law is so strict, a person will think a million times before robbing. Not that the police of Saudi Arabia is very intelligent, but the law is so strict that the moment you implement the law, you get results. The moment you make the law easy, if this law is relaxed in Saudi Arabia, robbery will start in Saudi Arabia also. And today, we look up to America as a country which is most advanced. Do you know it is a country which has one of the highest rates of theft and robbery? I'm asking the question that if you implement the Islamic Sharia in America and USA, that every rich person who has a saving of more than 85 grams of gold should give 2.5% of his excess wealth in charity. And after that, if any person robs, chop off his or her hand, I'm asking the question, will the rate of theft and robbery in America, will it increase, will it remain the same, or will it decrease? 
it will decrease. It's a practical law. It is not a very intelligent question that you have answered. It is simple logic. You implement the Sharia and you get results. So Islam is the only solution to the problems of humankind. Let me give you one more example. Most of the religions, they say, that it should not molest a woman, that it should not rape a woman. Hinduism says that, Christianity says that, Islam says the same. So what's the difference between Islam and the other religions? The difference is Islam, besides saying that it should not molest a woman, that it should not rape a woman, it shows you a way in which you can achieve a society in which there will be no molestation, there will not be any rape. Islam speaks about the system of hijab. Most of the people talk about the hijab for the woman. But Almighty God in the Quran first speaks about the hijab for the man and then for the woman. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 30, say to the believing man that whenever he looks at a woman, if any brazen thought comes, any unashamed thought comes, he should lower his gaze. There was a Muslim person, Muslim man, who was staring at a girl for a long time. I told him, brother, what are you doing? It's not allowed in Islam. So he told me, our beloved prophet said that the first glance is forgiven, the second is prohibited, I have not completed my first glance. <laughs> what did the prophet mean that the first glance is forgiven, the second is prohibited? That does not mean you can look at a woman for 10 minutes without blinking and saying I have not completed my glance. What the prophet meant that unintentionally, if you look at a woman, do not look at her again to feast on her beauty. The next verse speaks about the hijab for the woman. Almighty God says in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 31, Allah says, that say to the believing woman that she should lower her gaze and guard her modesty and display not her beauty except what appears ordinarily of and draw her head covering over her bosoms and display not her beauty except in front of her father, her brother, her husband, and a big list of maram, the close relatives who she cannot marry is given. In short, there are six criteria for hijab mentioned in the Quran and the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad The first is the extent. For the man, it's from the navel to the knee. For the woman, the complete body should be covered. The only part that can be seen are the face and hands up to the wrist. The remaining five criteria are the same for the man and the woman. The second is the clothes they wear. It should not be tight so that it reveals the figure. Third, it should not be translucent or transparent so that you can see through the clothes. The fourth, the clothes should not be so glamorous so that it attracts the opposite sex. Fifth, it should not resemble that of the unbeliever. And sixth, it should not resemble that of the opposite sex. And the Quran says in Surah Azab, chapter number 33, verse number 59, O Prophet, tell your wives, your daughters, and the believing woman that when they go abroad, they should put on the jilbab, they should put on the overcoat, over cloak, so that they shall be recognized and it will prevent them from being molested. The Quran says hijab had been prescribed for the woman so that they shall be recognized as modest and it will prevent them from being molested. I would like to ask a simple question. That, suppose there are twin sisters who are very beautiful, who are equally beautiful. And one of them, she is wearing the Western clothes, mini skirts or shorts. And the other twin sister, she is wearing the Islamic hijab, complete body covered, except the face and hands up to the wrist. And if they're walking down the streets of Bombay, maybe at Pedder Road or Napinsi Road, where we have many bird watchers, if they're walking down the streets of Pedder Road or Napinsi Road, and if round the corner, there is a hooligan who's waiting for a catch, who's going to tease a girl. I'm asking the question, which girl will he tease? Will he tease the girl wearing the mini skirt or shorts? Or will he tease the girl wearing the Islamic hijab? Which girl will he tease? But naturally, the girl wearing the mini skirt. So Quran rightly says that hijab has been prescribed for the woman so that they shall be recognized that they're modest and will prevent them from being molested. After that, the Islamic Sharia says, any man, rapes any woman, he gets capital punishment, death penalty. Many non-Muslims say, death penalty? 
in this age of science and technology, in the 21st century, Islam is a barbaric religion. It's a ruthless way of life. But when you ask this question, and I've asked this question to thousands of non-Muslims, that God forbid, suppose someone rapes your mother, or someone rapes your sister, and if you are made the judge, and if the rapist is born in front of you, what punishment will you give to that rapist? And believe me, 100%, 100% of the non-Muslims, they said, we will put him to death. Some went to the extreme of saying, we will torture him to death. There was only one smart Alex when I went to USA. He told me, the brother Zakir, I will give him five years imprisonment. I said, fine. Then I told him that according to the statistics of America, out of those people who are convicted for rape and they are given imprisonment, when they come out, 95% rape again. So if you want your mother to be raped again, you're most welcome. We Muslims don't want that. So he told me, if that is the case, then I would give him death penalty as the first shot. Today, America, we look up to America as the most advanced country in the world. Do you know it is a country which has one of the highest rate of rape? According to the statistics of the FBI in 1990 alone, every day, 1,756 rapes took place. Again, repeated in 1996. It says that every day, on average, 2,713 cases of rape took place in America. That means every 32 seconds, one rape is taking place in America. We are here for one and a half hour. Already more than a hundred rapes may have taken place in America since the time we are here. I am asking you the question that if you implement the Islamic Sharia in America, that any man looks at a woman, if any unashamed thought comes in his mind, he should lower his gaze. After that, every woman, she should be modestly dressed, complete body covered, except the face and hands up to the wrist. And after that, if any man rapes a woman, he gets capital punishment, death penalty. I'm asking you the question, will the rate of rape in America, will it increase, will it remain the same, or will it decrease? It will decrease. Easy question, easy answer. You don't have to be a scholar to know this. You implement the Sharia, and you get results. But, because Islam gives the solution, it does not go down the throat. But a few years ago, the Home Minister of India, L.K. Adwani, he had said in the parliament, and he proposed that in India also, there should be death penalty for the rapist. And I congratulate him for that. I may not agree with his other policies, but as far as this policy is concerned, I agree with him that death penalty for the rapist. Maybe the next Home Minister will say that every woman in India should have the hijab on, inshallah. <laughs> if you want no rape to take place in India, anywhere in the world, whether it be America, UK, you implement the Sharia, you'll get results immediately. That's the reason the least rate of rape in any country in the world, it's in Saudi Arabia. Any country which implements the Islamic Sharia, Whatever part they implement, they get results. Whatever part they don't implement, they don't get results. Today we find that the religion of Islam, it is said to be a religion which degrades the woman, which subjugates the woman. For the complete answer, you can refer to my video cassette, Women Rights in Islam. Time does not permit me to speak in detail. But if we analyze today, the Western society, claiming to uplift the woman is actually they are degrading the woman. The Western talk of women's liberalization is nothing but a disguised form of deprivation of honor, degrading a soul, as well as exploitation of a body. The Western society claiming to uplift the woman have actually degraded her to a status of concubine, mistresses, and society butterflies, which are mere tools in the hands of pleasure seekers hidden behind the colorful screen of art and culture. In the name of art and culture and women's liberalization, what is the Western world doing? They are selling our daughters, they're selling our mothers, they're selling our sisters. And India, after a few years, what the Western country does, we find India is following that. Follow the good things, I've got no problem. You know, when I was in school, more than 20 years back, 
most of the newspaper they were clean you could hardly find any obscene photographs but now if you pick up any newspaper whether leading newspaper daily newspaper most of them almost all they have to have obscene photographs in it even on the sports page what do they have football star then they show the girlfriend so what does the girlfriend want to do with football they want to sell the paper women's liberation ronald do you know what the name i don't know all the names of the football stars and then they show the girlfriend then you find a cricketer and then they show the girlfriend so even on the sports page if there's no news of women then they show the girlfriend invariably all the newspapers and many newspapers have supplements supplements like times of india the most famous newspaper it's the largest selling english newspaper of the world largest selling daily newspaper of the world it has supplement called bombay times and people of bombay know what is bombay times famous for especially page number 3 <laughs> and this was a strategy and i do agree after getting this strategy the sale of times of india has increased i am not against times of india only i am talking about times of india because that's the paper i read daily you talk about any other newspaper dna hindustan times indian times up or down less or more you will find these women who are semi nude in the name of women's liberation so i have to tell my vendor my newspaper man that only give me times of india i don't want bombay times he saying sab ye free hai free move off me i said if you give me bombay times i won't pay you money he telling me free hai free don't worry sir it is free i said i don't want it only give me the main newspaper that i mentioned a few years back but today even in the main newspaper you have women either on the sports page either on international news either on the front page somewhere there you will find no wonder the selling of most of the newspapers have increased and we find in the name of women liberation in the name of art and culture in ads you will find most of the ads have got women if you see an ad of a motorcycle whether it be abroad or whether it be in india how many women ride motorcycle how many percentage less than 1% in india less than 1% abroad also but invariably in a motorcycle ad you will find a woman for what and i was told about the very famous bmw ad you know bmw car is very famous the bmw car the car which has a status is mercedes but for the youngsters the bmw is famous it has a good pickup it's a faster car so someone told me that one of the ads of bmw it had a girl in a bikini in front of the car and the caption was test drive her now who the girl or the car what are we doing are you selling your daughters your mothers your sisters islam does not believe in such kind of liberalization if you say this is liberalization we are happy with what we are we love our sisters we love our mothers we love our wives we love them we respect them and we want to protect them and we give them equal rights for more details about rights of women in islam refer to my video cassette women's rights in islam i would like to end my talk by trying to clarify the last misconception that islam was spread by the sword if you translate peace was spread by the sword peace was spread by the sword and you had noticed that in the exhibition in the panels we had certain common misnomers common misnomers like the world is flat you have a square triangle 2 plus 2 is equal to 5 islamic terrorism it's the same how the world is not flat it's a common misnomer 2 plus 2 is not equal to 5 similarly islam and terrorism it's exactly the opposite 
but it's a very common misconception. And the reply was given very well by Delessie O'Leary, a very famous historian, in the book Islam at the Crossroad on page number eight. And he says that history makes it clear that the legend of fanatical Muslims sweeping across the world, forcing Islam at the point of the sword, is the most fantastic, absurd myth that historians have ever repeated. It is the most absurd myth that historians have ever repeated. And we know from history that we Muslims, we ruled Spain for about 800 years. We did not force anyone at the point of the sword, neither did we do our message, we didn't convey the message. Later on, the crusaders came, they wiped off the Muslims. There was not a single Muslim who could openly give the Azan. If we wanted, we could have forced everyone to accept Islam at the point of the sword, but we didn't do it. We Muslims, the Arabs, we have been the lord of the Arab lands for the past 1400 years. For a few years, the British have came, for the few years, the French came, but overall, we have been the lord of the Arab land for the past 1400 years. Yet today, there are more than 14 million Arabs who are Coptic Christians. Coptic Christian means the Christians in generations. These 14 million Arab Coptic Christians, they are giving shahada, they are bearing witness that Islam was in spite of the point of the sword. We Muslims, we ruled this great country, India, for about a thousand years, the Mughals. If we wanted, we could have forced every Indian to accept Islam at the point of the sword. But we didn't do it. Today, more than 80% Indians, they are non-Muslims. These 80% non-Muslim Indians, they are giving shahada, they are bearing witness that Islam was in spite of the point of the sword. Today, the country which has the largest population of Muslims in Indonesia, which army went to Indonesia? Which army went to Malaysia, which has more than 50% Muslims? Which army went to the east coast of Africa? Which sword? It is the sword of the intellect. As Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 125. Invite all to the way of their Lord with the wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. It is the sword of the intellect which is conquering the hearts. It's not the sword of steel. It is the sword of reasoning and understanding which is winning over people. According to an article which came in the Plainsworth magazine, which was repeated in the Reader's Digest Almanac Yearbook, 1984. It gave the statistics of the increase in the major world religions in a span of 50 years, from 1934 to 1984. And number one religion which increased the maximum was Islam, 235%. Christianity, only 47%. I'm asking the question, which war took place in the span of 50 years, from 1934 to 1984, which forced millions of human beings to accept Islam. Which war? Which sword? It's a sword of intellect, sword of reasoning. Today, according to statistics, the fastest growing religion in America and USA is Islam. The fastest growing religion in Europe is Islam. I'm asking the question, who is forcing these Americans to accept Islam? Who is forcing the Europeans to accept Islam? And when the media says that Islam is subjugating the women, do you know out of those people who are accepting Islam in the world, about two-thirds, more than 65%, they are women. More than 65% who are accepting Islam in America, they are women. More than 65% who are accepting Islam in Europe, they are women. I'm asking you the question, if Islam subjugates the women, then why are the American women accepting Islam? Why are the European women accepting Islam? Why are the Indian women accepting Islam? Why? Because Islam has the solution for the problem of womankind. They have seen the world. When they see the world, they find that Islam is the only solution for the problems of womankind. And today we find, as I mentioned earlier, that there is virulent propaganda about Islam. On the media, we find that they are spreading misconception. But the more they're doing that, we find after 
this has reached epidemic levels. Writing against Islam, misconception about Islam, the propaganda against Islam increased. But I believe in the verse of the Quran of Surah Imran, chapter number three, verse number 54, where Allah says, Makrubah makr Allah wallahu khairul makreen. That they planned and plotted. Allah too planned. Allah is the best of planners. After 9 11, the amount of propaganda they're doing against Islam, do you know? After 9 11, the spread of Islam has increased. Only in a span of 10 months in USA alone, after 9 11, more than 34,000 Americans accept Islam. In Europe alone, more than 22,000 accepted Islam in 10 months' time after 9 11. And I go to Europe, I go to UK very often, I go to America, and I find that after 9 11, when I give talks, there are more Americans coming for my talk. There are more Europeans coming for my talk. It's good. They want to know what kind of religion is this. Some come to attack, some come to learn. We welcome both of them. We welcome both of them. I like people who attack with reasoning. I love them. And we know how that Omar, may Allah be pleased with him, was one of the staunchest enemies of Islam. And the Prophet prayed for his hidayah, he got hidayah, then he became one of the staunchest supporters of Islam. That is the reason when Muslim youngsters say that death to George Bush, I said, don't say death to George Bush, say, may Allah give hidayah to George Bush. And we find that the more they're attacking Islam, the more Islam is spreading. See, after 9 11, the crowd is increasing even here. And we find even in Bombay, non Muslims are coming. Previously, we used to give chance to anyone to ask a question. Since the last few years, in my talks, non Muslim first preference. But the Muslims complain that they never get a chance. And even today, inshallah, the first chance will be non Muslims only, inshallah. Allah gives the promise in the glorious Quran in no less than three different places. In Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 33. In Surah Fatah, chapter 48, verse number 28. As well as in Surah Saf, chapter 61, verse number 9. Who allazi arsala rasulahu biluda wa dhin al-haq liyuzir ala dhin kulli. Allah has sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth so that it will prevail over all the other ways of life, over all the other isms. However much the disbelievers don't like it. And enough is Allah as a witness. This deen, this religion of peace, submitting our will to Almighty God, is the only solution for the problems of humankind. I would like to end my talk with the quotation of the glorious Quran from Sulaiman Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 19, which says, In the deen, in the Lail Islam, Allah the Creator in the last and final revelation says that in the deen, in the Lail Islam, the only way of life, the only religion acceptable in the sight of Almighty God is peace acquired by submitting your will to Almighty God. Wa akhra dawana, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.